I'm Dan Monk, the director of the PECON program here at Colgate and a member of the MIST faculty. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, evening's event. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements and offer a few acknowledgments. Um, first, could I ask all of you to please turn off your cell phones so that we don't suffer any embarrassments here during the course of the talk? And that goes for our speaker, who's been checking his cell phone. Um, uh, I want to let you know that the last of this semester's PECON lectures will take place on the 10th of November when Professor Ian Roxborough of the State University of New York will speak on the sociology of knowledge that drives contemporary counterinsurgency do doctrine. Uh, Professor Roxborough advises and studies the U.S. military at one and the same time, so it will certainly be an interesting uh, presentation. Also on, the November, on November 17th, we'll be screening Alan Gibney's Taxi to the Dark Side. Uh, this will be the penultimate of, our, uh, of the films in our series this semester. Um, quick reminder for the students in the audience uh, that the deadline to apply for the PECON Human Security Fellowships, uh, which is given to individuals to work with the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, monitoring treaty compliance is uh, November 5th, and that the PECON concentration open house and the pre-registration session for already declared and panicked PECONistas is on Thursday uh, at 12 o'clock in room 110. We'll be offering you lunch. Um, I'd also like to thank the Middle East and Islamic Studies Program and the Jewish Studies Program at Colgate for kindly co-sponsoring this event, this evening's lecture. So, mabruk to the one and yeshur koach to the other. Um, now to go on to this evening's um, uh, presentation. Uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, a number of events have taken place in the Middle East that are likely to affect us, directly or indirectly. They've been covered in the media, but they've not really been extensively analyzed. Uh, given the pressures of news reporting about the current financial meltdown, the election, Joe the plumber, and the rest of it. So first, after its prime minister was forced to resign over imminent charges, uh, corruption charges, Israel's government has now fallen. Elections will take place within three to five months, throwing the country's internal politics and foreign policy into a kind of caretaker limbo. It is unlikely that the new elections will, ye will yield a clear mandate for any one ideological bloc in Israel, even as something else has taken place in the last 24 hours. A restive population of settlers in occupied land only two days ago called for violence against the state of Israel if any more of their cantonments are demolished by the police. In the last 24 hours also, the U.S. has begun attacking suspected jihadi camps well within Syria in a change in military policy, the implications of which have certainly not been discussed or perhaps understood in either the press or in the halls of power. The part of the Palestinian nation that is not in exile is not only divided geographically but between Gaza and the West Bank, but also politically between a PLO pseudo-state in the West Bank and a Hamas government in Gaza. The biggest employ employer in the former turns out to be the police, and in the latter, tunnel builders who smuggle goods from Egypt to circumvent Israel's continuing soft siege. In the last 24 hours, Iran's president has stated that he is not ill and so will likely run for re-election. Regardless of who leads that country, it is likely that it will continue to work and mostly most likely succeed in attaining nuclear capabilities in the next few years. And in the interim, it will threaten Israel with other unconventional weapons as a way of balancing the projection, unprecedented projection of American power in the Gulf, Afghanistan, and Iraq, all of which border Iran. Any one of these events that I've just described that have taken place within the last 24 hours could affect the interests of the United States. So it pays to ask the following question. Why, the, why, is the world's greatest super, why has the world's greatest superpower failed to broker or impose a solution in the Middle East? What would it take to affect such a solution? And why, and why might we think that after so many years of struggle and failure, with the entire region even more unsettled than ever, 
is there any chance of affecting meaningful positive change through the projection of American power? Aaron David Miller is uniquely positioned to address these questions and has done so in a highly acclaimed book entitled The Much Too Promised Land, on which his presentation this evening is based. David Lynch has apparently purchased the movie rights for this study, so uh, on the basis of its opening chapter alone, so please take advantage of the fact that the bookstore will have copies uh, for sale in the lobby afterwards to, uh, to see why. I'm just kidding about the David Lynch thing. Um, Aaron Miller is currently a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. For the last two decades, he served at the Department of State as an advisor to six secretaries of state where he helped formulate U.S. policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli peace process, most recently as the senior advisor for Arab-Israeli negotiations. He also served as the deputy special Middle East coordinator for Arab-Israeli negotiations, senior member of the State Department's policy planning staff, uh, and other important roles in our government. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Aaron Miller to Colgate University. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. I, I don't want to give a speech. I'd like to share some observations and impressions with you, and then uh, listen to your comments and try to answer as many questions as I possibly can. A, a few personal notes before I begin. Number one, I have both positive and negative associations with this place. I mean, it's extraordinarily beautiful. I've been here twice before. Um, the negative association is when I was a senior in high school, I applied here. I uh, wasn't rejected, but I was waitlisted, and um, someone either had extraordinarily good or poor judgment, because I ended up going somewhere else, and who knows? Life might have been fundamentally different. My positive associations with Daniel Monk, who I first met uh, when he was a, um, a resident scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, um, you're lucky to have him, and I, I, I'll only say this. Uh, I give my own kids many pieces of advice. Um, my daughter is 28, my son is 25. They're both out of college uh, and now into graduate schools. Um, and they usually don't take my advice very seriously, but there is one piece of advice that they've really thought about, and it has much to do with um, Professor Monk. The happiest people that I know in life, professionally, Forget the personal aspect, That's you're on your own there. But the happiest people I know professionally in life are the ones who are fortunate enough to combine two rather extraordinary qualities, passion on one hand and expertise on the other. But they must go together because passion without expertise can be dangerous and there are numerous examples over the last, certainly over the last eight years, I would argue, in my case over the last 16, where passion without knowing what you were doing leads not necessarily to catastrophe, but to failure. So passion with a, without expertise can be dangerous and expertise without passion can be remarkably boring. I think that um, Daniel combines both. He loves what he does and he knows what he's talking about. And in this particular field, any remote aspect of it, Arab-Israeli conflict, Middle East, the history of Israel, conflict studies, peace studies, and by the, way, wait, by the way, that word, peace, really needs to be redefined if I could banish it from the vocabulary pertaining to the Middle East, I would. Because Arabs and Israelis have never had peace, they don't have peace now, and it's highly unlikely for the foreseeable future that they will have anything that you and I could remotely understand and recognize as peace. But you're lucky to have him, is my point. Um, a few other personal notes. I'm not running for anything. I'm associated with nobody's campaign, either Barack Obama or John McCain. I don't want a position in government. I had my 25 years which I provided good advice and a lot of bad advice. And as a consequence of my newfound freedom, uh, which Janis Joplin wrongly described as simply another way of saying that you have nothing left to lose, 
Um, I have been given the luxury now of two things that are missing from human interaction and certainly from diplomacy. One is honesty and the other is clarity. Honesty and clarity are absolutely critical and they become more critical in personal relationships, friendships, marriages, business propositions and diplomacy as the stakes go up. The stakes in the Middle East for America, and I, I want to talk about America. I'm not here to um, spend a lot of time talking about the Arabs and the Israelis. I care a great deal about them, but I care more about America. And the reality is we have serious problems. Clarity and honesty will be absolutely critical for the next administration. And I suspect, and I'm despairing about this, there may be too little of it. Uh, when morning dawns again in America uh, on January 20th, 2009. So let me share a number of observations gathered from the negotiator's highway. The next president, and let me be very clear, um, since there is only one president in the post-World War II period for a member of the same party succeeding a two-term president, and that was the president's father, who won a first term after two terms of Ronald Reagan. The odds are remarkably high that the next president of the United States will be Barack Obama. He will confront an angry, dysfunctional Middle East riddled with rage and unresolved problems. And as America's president, he will find himself in an investment trap, an investment trap from which he cannot escape, on one hand, and an investment trap in which he cannot fix. He cannot fix this region, and he cannot extricate America from it. He will confront this problem with tremendously high expectations and very little credibility and influence. As a consequence of policies pursued over the last 16 years, this is not just a Republican problem. This is a Democratic problem, a Republican problem, and in the end, an American problem. The current president and his talented Secretary of State were right. We do confront a new Middle East, but it's a new Middle East that is extraordinarily nastier than the old one. Arab-Israeli peace was always a long shot. It was always the long play for America. And failure was not the exception. Failure was the rule. Now, the prospects for failure have been made even more complex by any number of factors. A weak Arab center that will not stand up unless America does on the issue of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. An Israeli leadership which is confronting, in my judgment, a much more profound crisis than simply a transition with all of the tick-tock involved in coalition formation. More on that in a minute. A Palestinian national movement that is probably confronting its greatest crisis in a, in a half a century, for which it has no answer, no easy or quick answer. And four actors, <clears throat> two state actors, Iran and Syria, and two non-state actors, Hamas and Hezbollah, who have emerged in part as a consequence of American failure and mistakes, in part as a consequence of their own determination and sheer grit to play a critical role <clears throat> in just about everything America cares about in this region, from nuclear proliferation to Lebanon to democratization to the future of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. In short, Barack Obama will confront a Middle East against the backdrop of 16 years of failure. Eight years under Bill Clinton in which America stumbled badly in how to assist Arabs and Israelis and Palestinians in taking advantage of real opportunities that existed. And eight years under George W. Bush in which America stumbled galactically in how to make war preventive, preemptive, wars of choice. And if you can't make peace or help to make peace, and you cannot prosecute your interests 
using American power and military force. Well, it's an arguable proposition about what kind of great power you really are. I'm getting ready to turn 60, and I am absolutely persuaded that the most compelling ideology in life is not nationalism, it's not democracy, it's not capitalism, it is success. That's the most compelling ideology because success generates power and success generates constituents. Failure, on the other hand, generates the opposite. So what's a new president to do about one, just one, of the major problems that will confront America, not just for the next four to eight years. I measured my life in terms of administrations. That's neither how our adversaries or our allies think. They think in terms of generations. And we need to adjust our calibration as a great power, hopelessly trapped in a world of small tribes. We have to adjust what time actually means and what success and failure actually means in this region. But what's a new president to do with the Arab-Israeli issue? How's he to conceptualize it? And how is he to find an American policy that, in my judgment, borrows the diplomatic equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath, which for doctors is to, above all, do no harm? For diplomats and presidents and strategists, it may well be, above all, avoid failure. I'm not in the advice giving business in any formal sense, but I will offer you 10 observations. You can count them down. And we can argue, by the way, about every one of them. I'll offer you 10 observations drawn from the negotiator's highway over the course of studying, analyzing, observing, and participating in the pursuit of Arab-Israeli peacemaking in some capacity for almost 25 years. Number one, no bricks without straw. I don't care how much America wants this or that, how passionately we are devoted to this, how knowledgeable we may be, how powerful we may be. We cannot create the political will required by those who live in the neighborhood to actually take the decisions relating to an existential conflict. In a, in a, in a month in which the word derivative has been used over and over and over again, our policy and success or failure is derivative on the actions of others in the world in which we live. Every breakthrough that has been achieved in 50 years of American diplomacy, and in my judgment there have only been three, more on that in a minute, has come as a consequence of either a crisis or an opportunity in which the locals have acted and America as a great power, has reacted. And in an existential conflict, when from the perspective of those who live it, wage it, and must bear the consequences of their own decisions, in a way, this is as it should be. It is as it should be. Niebuhr talked about the reality that we cannot manage history. I believe that. I believe if given the proper environment, America can find a way to take advantage of events. But the notion of imposition of a solution or forced solution, it seems to me, is without historical precedent, not just for the 50 years in which we've had serious Arab-Israeli negotiations, but in the history of great powers and this region, which is littered with the remains of great powers who wrongly believed they could impose their will on small tribes. Small tribes will always have a greater stake in the outcome of their problems than a great power 
which may be truly consequential, but which is distant, preoccupied with other matters, and does not have the same level of commitment. If you wanted to understand American policy, not just to the Middle East, all you've got to do is concentrate on where we are. We are the only great powered power in the history of the world to have achieved the unrivaled, unprecedented, unparalleled physical security that we have. We are surrounded by non-predatory neighbors to our north and to our south, and fish to our east and to our west. This single fact in the real estate business, they would argue, location, location, location. I submit to you that America's great strengths, its pragmatism, its optimism, its idealism, its capacity to detach itself, and America's weaknesses, its naivety, its arrogance, its exceptionalism, when in fact that exceptionalism extends beyond our borders, flows from this one fundamental fact. We do not know what it is really like to live on the knife's edge. And as a consequence, we're neither mean enough, tough enough, or have a great and sustained enough stake to compete with smaller powers who do. The test for the next president is to use our power and our influence, assuming Arabs and Israelis are interested in doing serious peacemaking in a way that has escaped us over the course of the last 16 years. To know what the price of agreements really are between Israelis and Palestinians and Israelis and Syrians and to see the world the way they see it to a much greater degree than we have been capable of in the past. And a diplomatic process is fine. We are masters of process. But too much water has flowed under the bridge. A process is no longer sufficient. You're going to need results. Two. Nobody ever washes a rental car. Larry Summers, who, with whom we worked during the 90s when he was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury and at the World Bank, said a lot of very controversial things, which is one of the reasons he's no longer president of Harvard. But when he said this, he said something of profound value. Nobody ever washes a rental car. Of what, what wisdom is there in such a statement? Well, it's clear. You only care about what you own. You only care, really, about what you own. It is, a, it is part of the human condition. Unless the next president owns this, assuming he's interested in a serious American policy, and this is still an arguable proposition. Governing is about choosing. This man will be overloaded with a set of domestic galactic challenges, campaign commitments, and other expectations, given the uniqueness of what's going to happen in America on January 20th. He may well decide to take this on in a certain way, but not to own it. But if he wants to have any chance of succeeding, he must. He must persuade Arabs and Israelis that this is a top priority. He must persuade his domestic political players in this country that he is serious about it and that it exists as an American national interest. Because if he doesn't, he will be manipulated and played like a finely tuned violin by Arabs and Israelis and their respective supporters here at home. He must identify a Secretary of State who has three qualities. 
That person speaks with the authority of the President of the United States. That person knows what a negotiation is, how to structure it, and how to close it. And finally, that person must have a certain toughness, even deviousness, in order to have any chance of succeeding. Now, I look around, I live in this place called Washington, and I look around and I despair because I couldn't identify anyone who would be considered viable for this position that has those three qualities. But maybe, maybe someone will grow into the job. But this is absolutely critical. Three, and I'll be very precise about this because it's much misunderstood and it's gotten me into an enormous amount of trouble in the past. Uh, so let me be very precise. America must be, because it already is, Israel's best friend. But it cannot be in a negotiation. It cannot be Israel's only lawyer. I wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post in May of 2005, which got me into an enormous amount of trouble. It was called Israel's lawyer. And it argued that too many officials in the Clinton administration, including myself, when it came to Arab-Israeli negotiations, saw the world too much through the eyes of one of the participants to the conflict. And I thought the point was irrefutable. If, in fact, you want an agreement between two parties, and you are the mediator, then you must take into account the needs and the requirements of each side. Otherwise, how could there be an agreement? I mean, this is so stunningly simple that it escaped me why people became so angry, including the former president. I interviewed all of our presidents, including Jerry Ford before he died for my book, but I could not get Clinton to see me a man for whom I have tremendous respect and admiration. So angered was he at this particular charge. Now, just to set your minds at ease, we are not and have never been, in my judgment, an honest broker when it comes to Arab-Israeli peacemaking. Not in the strictly neutral sense. Because the truth is we are much closer and will always be closer to one of the parties to the negotiations, the Israelis. We can, however, be an effective mediator. It has a lot to do with a concept called the paradox of the partial mediator. The paradox of the partial mediator. In a negotiation, the question is, from the standpoint of the negotiating parties, and their view toward the third party. Do you want someone who is strictly neutral, or do you want someone who can deliver what you want, but who also has an intimacy and an influence with the party from whom you want something? Sadat was the first Arab leader to understand the implications of the of the paradox of the partial mediator. He used Kissinger and later Carter without engaging in any direct negotiations with the Israelis to get America to deliver what it is he wanted because Sadat understood the paradox of the partial mediator. He knew that if he wanted Sinai Bank, 100% of it, if he wanted the dismantling of all Israeli settlements in Sinai, and if he wanted the off-the-table benefits, economic and military assistance from the United States, he would have to create a relationship with America based in part on the paradox of the partial mediator. It works, it works 
if America understands the difference between having a special relationship with the state of Israel and an exclusive relationship, and I would argue to you quite simply that for the last 16 years, we have allowed this special relationship to become exclusive. What do I mean by that? I mean we've allowed under both Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush, Israel to dictate and to dominate our tactics and strategy when it came to Arab-Israeli peacemaking. We've demanded almost no reciprocity from the Israelis when it comes to their own behavior on issues that have nothing, you have to reassure my friends in the Jewish community, that have nothing to do with Israeli security, including housing demolitions, land confiscation, bypass roads, and settlements. In 25 years of working on this problem, I cannot recall one serious conversation that any American president or secretary of state had with an Israeli prime minister in a comprehensive manner about the costs and consequences of settlements. Now, the term Israel's lawyer <coughs> evokes from many in the Jewish community a certain amount of hysteria. I just came from giving two talks at the American Israeli Israel Public Affairs Committee's National Summit in Chicago just yesterday. And I laid out this entire rap. And everyone listened. And there was very little pushback. But there's a deep unease and disquiet among American Jews. In my book, I talk about a concept which I name the cosmic oive. Cosmic oive, in my judgment, is the inability on the part of many American Jews to separate what is important on the issue of American policy and Israel from what is not important. Everything is elevated to a level of existential angst. Everything. And it flows from many, there are many reasons for it. Yesterday, in front of AIPAC, I made the stunning assertion that the conflict between Israel's detractors and supporters in America on the issue of whether or not America should have a special relationship with the state of Israel is over. It's ended. It's done. Stick a fork in it. It no longer matters. Israel, in the mind of America, has secured a place unprecedented in the annals of American foreign policy. Israel has ingrained itself in American culture, into American politics, into American foreign policy in an extraordinary way. And when we recognize the special character of that relationship and use it to our advantage and do not allow it to become exclusive, we can actually be effective at what we do. It's very, very difficult for American Jews to understand this, in my judgment. Jews worry for a living. Their history, by any rational standard, would impel them to do so. And frankly, my advice to them would be worry when it comes to matters co concerning Israel's reality in this new and nastier Middle East. Worry plenty, <clears throat> because if I were an Israeli, and I'm not, I would be extremely concerned about what is happening. But do not worry and never accuse or confront a senior American official with charges that somehow America is only waiting to sacrifice Israeli interests on the altar of American expediency. It is a mythology. It was never true. It isn't true now. And unless Israel changes in the mind of America, which is possible, not likely, given our investment, it may never be true. And this, it would seem to me, point number three, be Israel's special friend but not its lawyer, will be the single greatest challenge 
to President Obama. Bill Clinton was the most pro-Israeli democratic president ever. George W. Bush, according to the established Jewish community, and it, the Jewish community is a complicated community, but the groups who speak for it and the groups that American policymakers listen to are, are its establishment, me establishment members. George W. Bush, in many American Jews' mind, was the most pro-Israeli Republican president ever. That's a pretty remarkable record. And in my judgment, it's not going to change. We simply have to decide to convince ourselves of what we, to unconvince ourselves of what we've convinced ourselves of in the last 16 years, that we can't be Israel's best friend and an effective mediator at the same time. We can be, and we must be. Four, the chances of a conflict-ending solution, and I'm choosing my words very carefully here. If I were, if I got an opportunity to advise President Obama, the chances of a conflict-ending solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are slim to none. And when I say conflict-ending, that's exactly what I mean. I mean the four core issues, Jerusalem border security and refugees, are resolved. No more irredenta. An Israeli and a Palestinian leader will stand up to their respective publics and say the conflict is over and make good on it in the way they condition and educate their respective publics. The chances of that happening are slim to none. They are slim to none for several reasons which are worth pointing out. Not in any order of priority, but I have my favorite. First is the galactically complicated nature of the issues themselves. Do not let anyone tell you, because it's part of the mythology that at the Camp David summit in July of 2000, there were 12 Americans there, and Camp David was the poster child for postmodernism, because you had 12 Americans there, you had at least eight different accounts of what actually transpired and why it transpired. But one thing I know for sure, we were not this close to an agreement, and we're not this close to an agreement now. I would argue we're probably this close these are identity issues. They are territorial issues. They summon up issues of trauma, of historical memory, of wounding, of, of identity. Jerusalem alone boggles the mind when you think about its one complicated piece, the problem of overlapping sacred space. Overlapping sacred space. The eighth day of the Camp David summit, we wrestled with this problem. The Israelis asserted sovereignty over what lay below the harem, the remains of both Jewish temples, Har Habayit. And the Palestinians asserted sovereignty over the haram itself and the two mosques and the area which encloses them. And neither would compromise it. We tried many different approaches. We tried giving sovereignty to the Israelis below ground and sovereignty to the Palestinians above. I thought that was actually one of my favorite ideas. We thought about repositing sovereignty where it belonged, with God. It's sacred space, after all. Why should either of them assert sovereignty? It's as if we were trying to divide Jerusalem as if it were a piece of salami. This city is bathed in blood for a very long period of time. Because as much as Judaism, Christ, uh, Christianity, and Islam may have in common, they aspire to religious exclusivity and triumphalism. These are tribal matters. They're sacred matters. Sovereignty is not to be shared. Jerusalem is not to be shared. It's to be possessed in the name of God, in the name of the tribe, in the name of the nation. 
That's one problem. Second is the problem of what I, <clears throat> in a trivial way, and please don't take this the wrong way, a problem of what I call the Palestinian Humpty Dumpty, which has fallen off the wall and cracked in a way that was, extra it's, it's, it's remarkable when I think about it. Palestinian national movement is more divided now in terms of its tactics, its strategies, its geography, its politics than at any time in its history. The problem that we thought was once resolved, who would represent Palestinians? Well, it's the PLO, arguably the secular manifestation of Palestinian nationalism, is once again up for grabs because it's challenged by, and I don't want to draw too severe a, a dichotomy here, by the religious manifestation of Palestinian nationalism, Hamas. But the problem for Palestinians is one in particular. Unless a polity state maintains a monopoly over the forces of violence within its own society, it will never gain the respect of its own constituents, let alone the respect of its neighbors. In short, one authority, one gun, one negotiating position. I don't care if it's whatever, however you describe Hamilton, New York, whoever runs Hamilton, New York. That, that authority maintains control over the forces of violence in the society. It doesn't control all the guns. There are criminal enterprises, there are murders, there are burglaries, but you do not have political factions openly challenging the authority of the government, of the existing polity. You can't have that and have credibility. No Palestinian leader now speaks for all Palestinians. And no Palestinian leader can commit the Palestinian people to a negotiating position. And no Israeli pr prime minister would ever make existential concessions to a Palestinian partner who didn't control all the guns. What's the point? Really, what's the point? And finally, Israel. If the settlement enterprise weren't dysfunctional enough in terms of creating problems to prejudge and predetermine the outcome of a negotiation, then in my judgment, the leadership crisis that the state of Israel faces today would be. Israel, against all the tick-tock of coalitions and all the rest, Israel is in a transition from its founders and its founding generation who had moral authority, historic legitimacy, and the legitimacy of success. These are the three kinds of, in my judgment, this is what makes leaders successful. They have moral legitimacy, they have historic legitimacy, or they actually do stuff that works. That's why they get reelected, and that's how, how they maintain power. The founders are gone. Shimon Peres is the president. If you asked him, he would not say he was at the end of his political career, but he is, and Sharon is in a coma. And we've already seen three examples of young Israeli prime ministers Netanyahu, Barak, and Omer, who frankly, have, and I'm being kind here, have not measured up. So what kind of leader will it take to lead the people of Israel to these sorts of decisions? Who's going to trust and have confidence in? What leader? So the Israeli-Palestinian problem is poised between a two-state solution that is improbable and a one-state outcome that is, in my judgment, unimaginable. It is in these parameters of conflict and accommodation that the Israeli-Palestinian dynamic will play itself out. And the, perverse, the perverseness of it all is, is mind-boggling. It's almost as if Israelis and Palestinians have a self-regulating mechanism not to push matters too far 
so that they would get to the point where the pain is so intense that they would, in fact, see their way through. But in my judgment, based on what I've observed, Palestinians and Israelis have an unlimited capacity to dole it out, pain that is, and to absorb it. Five, the foreign policy advisors to the next president, to Barack Obama, are even now plotting and trying to determine what, if anything, he will be able to do in the Arab-Israeli issue. And the one track, the one approach which is out there so self-evident, so compelling, is, is very obvious, and that is an Israeli-Syrian agreement. That is where the traction will be. That is where the effort will be put. And if you got an Israeli prime minister and a Syrian president who are prepared to pay the price, which, by the way, is by no means certain, and an American Secretary of State backed up by a president, I'm going to use these three words several times before I'm done, who is tough, fair, and smart, you might actually get such an agreement which would be historic in its own right. And it has the added bonus in the minds of the strategists that it will begin to have resonance with respect to Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah. That's the additional incentive that you get for doing this deal. Two states governed by a disengagement agreement signed on June 1st, 1974, which has kept the Israeli-Syrian border the quietest in the neighborhood. Two states, limited settlers, some emotion, some ideology, no refugees, no Jerusalem. That's the deal. It would seem to me that the new administration is going to invest in. Six, we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with Iran. And I'll say at the outset, there is nobody that I've met, and I would put myself at the top of the list, no one in Washington, no one anywhere that has a solution to this problem. Not the nuclear issue, not containment, not engagement. We don't have a strategy to deal with Iran. And yet Iran sits at the nexus of everything we care about nuclear proliferation, the Arab-Israeli issue, Iraq, Lebanon. And the Iranians are a state driven by a profound sense of entitlement and a profound sense of insecurity. They believe rightly that they are a great power with a long and rich tradition. And we're going to have to find a way to deal with them because the Arab-Israeli process cannot somehow be hermetically sealed any longer from other regional forces. But the one I would put at the top of the list is Iran. And um, I don't have the answer here, and I'm not even, I, I wouldn't insult your intelligence by trying to come up with a strategy or even propose one in which you could guarantee that an effective piece of diplomacy or a military confrontation, which is the last thing we need, would somehow regulate, contain, moderate, or create a modus vivendi between America and Iran? I don't have the answer, and I admit it. Seven, we will have to, if the Arabs and the Israelis are interested in this, emerge as a broker, not as a facilitator. There's a big difference between the two. We facilitated for eight years under Bill Clinton. We did less than facilitate for eight years under George W. Bush. Three Americans deserve entry into the Peace Process Hall of Fame. I created it, I nominated them, I voted them in, and I argue with anybody who wants to take any of them out or add additional Americans. Uh, and so far, no one has made a credible argument to the contrary. They all contributed in different ways. Their accomplishments are not the same. They all had other deficits in their diplomacy in other parts of the world. I continue to remind Professor Monk. Um, 
two Republican secretaries of state, and one Democratic president. I'm not going to play 20 questions with you, but two Republican secretaries of state and one Democratic president got into the Peace Process Hall of Fame. I'll leave you with who they were. I'm sure by the end, somebody will be able to figure it out. Um, all of them brokered and did effective diplomacy. They, they not only did they not fail, they actually contributed something positive. In one case, something quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. Um, my point here is that they were not Israel's lawyers, and yet they worked with Israeli prime ministers to produce consequences and agreements from which the Israelis, Americans, and the Arabs benefited immensely. And while we cannot replicate their experiences, we need to figure out what they all had in common. But since the last one left office in 1992, for the last 16 years, we have not paid attention to how they did it. And if we're going to help Arabs and Israelis figure this out, we're going to have to. Eight, the Arab-Israeli peace process is no panacea. This is a dysfunctional region of the world. It remains immune to the forces of political change and even globalization in a way that very few other areas of the world have. I have my views about why, but that, that's really very much off the point. If you solve the Arab-Israeli conflict tomorrow, you would still not fix it. However, this conflict resonates in this region with an intensity and an emotion that is extremely important to American national interests. And we could do ourselves a great service and our badly tarnished credibility by creating a serious policy to manage and, and act and actually resolve pieces of it if we can. Uh, I'm a baseball fan, and I'll quote Casey Stengel here, who said that the key to good management was keeping the nine guys who hate your guts away from the nine guys who haven't made up their minds. And there are a lot of people in this region who have not made up their minds about America. The president argues, well, they hate us because we love freedom. Well, you know, the truth is, I've spent almost as much time in that region as I've spent here. And this is not, for most, a conflict of civilizations. It's a conflict of interests. And a conflict of interests, unlike a conflict of values and civilizations, can be ameliorated to some degree. A serious policy on the Arab-Israeli issue would do that. Nine. We have to see the world the way it is, not the way we want it to be. And I've said to you before, I think that we, by definition, have a problem with this because of who we are and where we are. I mean, after all, we're the only, the first, excuse me, the first society, political system, founded on the basis of an idea what is that idea? That idea is the primacy of the individual. For someone in the 18th century to be talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was not only heretical, it was revolutionary. We believe in the primacy of the individual. We believe that the individual counts. We believe that the individual can change him or herself and transform the world around themselves. But that makes us very often see things in the ways we want to see them, not the way they really are. And we must pay attention to history, which we repeatedly avoid. I'm a trained historian. I actually have a PhD in history. And I actually wrote one serious history book. And yet I could count on one hand the number of times that I seriously tried to remind anyone 
or to encourage people to think in time. I'll give just one example. We occupied Japan between 1945 and 1952 for seven years. If I were to ask you yet another question, how many Americans were killed by Japanese during that seven year period in hostile actions in Japan? Remember, we were pulling Japanese fighters off of Pacific islands as late as the 1950s who refused to accept the proposition that the war was over. How many Americans were killed by Japanese during that seven year period? None. Not one or two. None. What were we thinking? when we launched this trillion dollar social science project called Iraq, what were we thinking in time? Were we thinking at all about the risks, the consequences, the relationship between means and ends, the politics of the polity that we were occupying? Finally, I'll close on an optimistic note. The first and last president who ever had an impact on me, which is in itself a sad comment. We've had 42 presidents. You don't count Grover Cleveland. We've actually had 43. But Grover Cleveland was president twice in non-consecutive terms. So we always say we have 43 presidents, but, and we did. But we have, only, we have 42 different presidents. You could make a case, maybe, that a half a dozen of them, maybe, I would argue there are only three great presidents. But you could probably stretch it to six to eight, maybe, in terms of near great, truly consequential. So we don't produce great presidents, which worries me about what's coming. But one that inspired me more than any other, I was 12 when he was assassinated, was Jack Kennedy. And Kennedy described himself, I later learned, in a way that is really, really important. It kind of changed my life. And if you don't take anything else away from here today, take this away. Kennedy described himself as an idealist without illusion. That's where America needs to be. Idealism without illusion. Never giving up on the possibility that the world can be changed. But as we try to change it. We really have to do so with our eyes wide open. So I'm going to stop here. I've already, I've already droned on for a bit too long. And I'll be more than happy to answer questions. It's a stunning, stunningly successful presentation. Nobody has any questions. Yes. You know, I laid out in, in the interest of honesty the reality that I don't have an approach that I think will work. I could paint a compelling case to you that Iran is absolutely going to possess a bomb, or I could paint another case that what the Iranians want is to approach the threshold but not cross it since the consequences of crossing it might be too consequential for them. The problem, obviously, is in perceptions and threat perceptions. Um, you know, the Israelis took out in 1981 the OSIRAC reactor, which was an, a plutonium extraction plant. It was very poorly defended. It was a remarkable operation, but it bears no resemblance to what the Iranians have done. Their gas centrifuges are subterranean, they're redundant, they're well defended. And then, of course, there are the consequences to our interests in the event of an Israeli military attack or an American military attack. I would remind you all that in the summer of 2006, 5,000 guys with relatively low-level rockets, katushas and some grads, shut down the northern half of the Middle East's most preeminent military power for 34 days. For 34 days, if you lived 
from Haifa north to the Israeli-Lebanese border, you didn't have a normal life. And that's 5,000 guys in, in Lebanon. So thinking about consequences should be very much the order of the day. That said, um, I don't fear an Iranian nuclear attack on the United States. Israelis have a serious and legitimate problem, which I might add they cannot take care of militarily without cost and consequence um, or politically, which means we, the next president, will have to find a way to probably engage and to test the proposition that, in fact, there can be tactical coincidence of interest between Iran and the United States. I don't think there's a grand strategic bargain or big deal out there unless we're literally prepared to allow the Iranians to do what they've wanted to do since the Safavids, which frankly may well be the case, which is to dominate the Gulf or to emerge as the most consequential power in the Gulf, Persian Gulf, not the Arab Gulf, the Persian Gulf, and to become a pivotal, po pivotal power in the Arab-Israeli arena. I can only say this about our policy so far. We have made it much easier. So uh, I think you will begin to see the signs of change. Probably within two or three weeks of the election, the Bush administration will create an interest, an interest section in Tehran. We already have an interest section there. The Swiss maintain it. But we will add diplomats. And they will add diplomats to their interest section in Washington, which will be hailed as a significant, and it is, significant step. It will then be up to the supreme leader to begin to look at the June elections of 09 for the next Iranian president and to determine who he wants to steward or to be the public face of Iran's foreign policy for the next four years. Because it was Khamenei who elected Ahmadinejad in 05. He came from nowhere. It was the supreme leader's support that threw the election to him. I do not believe Iran is a crazy state. I think it's profoundly entitled and profoundly insecure, which I made I made the point before, I think that's a very dangerous combination. I do not think it's self-destructive. I think it's possible to overplay a hand as Saddam overplayed his hand, never anticipating the military response from the United States, um, but not a crazy state. So if I had a guess, and I really don't like to do this, I would say the next year will bring no Israeli or American military attack against Iran on the level that we're describing. Yes. Well, I'm not sure that yeah, is it possible to change American public opinion to create a different perception among the public? I don't think American public opinion plays a critical role here, and so does the uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. But the, the fact that lobbies lobby is not the issue. Of course lobbies lobby. We live in a system which is designed to be lobbied. You read the Constitution, read the Federalist Papers. They knew the implications of interest groups and lobbyists, but it's the nature of the system. American policy 
is an interaction between various factors in a system. It's public opinion, it's the media, it's Congress, it's the lobbies. But guess what? Above all of this sits the President of the United States, who is supposed to articulate a wise and judicious policy that is driven by the American national interest. Those other factors constrain the President, and well, they should, in our system. I mean, I no more want the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee to be in charge of our policy as I would the Near Eastern specialists at the Department of State. It's the interaction between the system. The question is, do presidents lead? Not that lobbies lobby. The Jewish community in this country and the pro-Israeli lobby, which now includes millions of evangelical Christians, both fundamentalist and traditionalist, and I, for my book, I went out and interviewed them, all of them, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, it's a very important piece of the pro-Israeli constituency in America. But none of them, not the Jewish lobby, not the Christian lobby, is a match for an American president who demonstrates, with the support of public opinion, which he will have, support for a policy that makes sense and that actually shows the prospect of succeeding. Every time, in the case of my three uh, Hall of Fame nominees, um, they led, the lobby pushed, they won. And it will happen again if an American president decides to make this a priority. Yes. If, if we assume that you do know and the media and some through Congress on you know, border settlement you agree with, what do you think that would imply for what's going on in Lebanon? Well, well there was a time where it was a natural corollary that a breakthrough in the Israeli Syrian negotiations would lead to an Israeli Lebanese negotiation. And you get a twofer, basically. Because of Syrian influence in Lebanon. It was assumed. Now, the Syrians aren't nearly as influential as they were, but Hezbollah is. And I'm, I, I play this one out in my own mind, and I can't, I don't have an answer for it. If there is a breakthrough between Israel and Syria and an agreement, what will Hezbollah's position be on an actual Israeli Lebanese negotiation, let alone? a peace treaty. And it's hard for me to see now that Hezbollah would accept this state of affairs. I think it will pose Iran and Hezbollah with some very, very tough choices. But Lebanon's problems, frankly, in the end, the Lebanese dysfunction is a consequence of, I would argue, the Lebanese themselves, primarily. Lebanon had a true national compact, a viable contract between the governed and those who govern, where the governed willingly surrender power to the state, on the, as we do here, on the assumption that the state will exercise it wisely. And if it doesn't, guess what? Like a, wa like a used washing machine or a used car. In 48 years, there'll be time for a new one. But that's not the Lebanese character. Lebanon is a conglomeration of minorities who are in Lebanon precisely to escape the power of the state or of the dominant group, whether they're Armenians or Maronite Christians or Greek Orthodox or Druze or Shia. So that problem, in my judgment, is the core issue for the Lebanese, and I am not optimistic. It's compounded by two regional neighbors, the Israelis and the Syrians, who have always made decisions which, well, as regional great powers, of course they're going to make decisions that are in their own interests first. So I'm not optimistic about 
the future of Lebanon. I think it's going to be extremely messy. An Israeli-Syrian agreement, however, would begin a process, a historic process of choices for Lebanese actors that we've never seen before. Yes. Um, well, and it, it, was it Fitzgerald who said there are no second acts in American politics? In Israel, there are second and third and fourth acts. Um, here's what we can say with some measure of certainty. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu will represent the Likud in elections, whether they're held in January or February. Tippi Livni, head of Kadima, will be the other major candidate. Neither may get the kind of majority that will give them a capacity to govern. From here on in, it's all who knows. There could be an emergency national unity government. Uh, depending on what happens if we now in elections, one of them could pull more mandates than the other. The question, however, is not that, but I, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to trivialize this or prejudge it because Daniel will be very critical. I'm not sure in the greater scheme of things it's going to make much of a difference. Um, neither of them, by the looks of things, will have the kind of electoral legitimacy, moral authority, or in the case of Netanyahu, a better finance minister than prime minister. In the case of Livni, I mean, the campaign will be run as Ms. Inexperience versus Mr. Security and Economics. That's what, that's what the camp sounds familiar. That's what the campaign is going to be run on. But since most Israeli elections are decided by the 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the public whose votes float, it's almost impossible to determine right now which of those two would actually be the prime minister. Livni represents a, a sort of center-left position. And well, you know what Netanyahu represents. He embodies and encompasses much about the Israeli right, although he has demonstrated a certain pragmatism and practicality when he was prime minister. So um, there are four elections that are coming. There's ours, and that one's already over. There's, uh, it's not an election, there's a boss's Constitution, Mahmoud Abbas's, the Palestinian Authority's president's constitutional crisis, which he will confront on January 9th, when um, there are supposed to be elections for a new president, and there won't be. There are the Israeli elections, and there are the Iranian elections. So I would hold my powder until July to see how all of this, uh, by July of next year, you'll have a much better idea of the impact, I'm serious, the impact of these changes and transitions on the actual policies and shape of this region. Yes. Well, yeah, but yes, the answer is yes. But the reality is that the core elements in these negotiations will all have to be negotiated. 
but the elements of that initiative, which are very general, um, contain, it seems to me, the parameters of what would be an acceptable deal for both sides if the myriad of problems contained in each of the elements can be worked through. For example, we have one precedent for Arab-Israeli peace that involved the serious exchange of territory. Only one, and that was Egypt-Israel. You have Israel-Jordan, but there was a leasing agreement, and, and there really wasn't a serious transfer of territory. The Egypt-Israeli peace treaty was a 100% deal, 100%. Um, if the Israelis and Syrians want an, a peace agreement, then it's going to cost both of them 100%. Assad Jr. will have to get all of the Golan Heights, and not, I might add, 99.9%, which Barack was prepared to offer him in the spring of 2000, minus 300 yards on the northeastern portion of the lake. Syrians want to swim, as Assad told us many times, in the lake. He swam as a boy in the lake. He wants to swim in the lake. So, yeah. Syria will get its 100%. There'll be some artful fix over time to deal with the issue of water and access. And Assad's 100% to the Israelis will have to be a set of security arrangements which are viable and cohesive and make sense and a normalization package which is more than a glorified non-belligerency agreement. I mean, the problem with Assad, the elder's negotiating strategy, was that he wanted 100%, but he wasn't prepared to pay for it. And I know all the arguments about why it isn't Israel's to give, that this is not Israeli territory, so it's not a concession. Israel shouldn't feel like it's giving anything to the Arabs because it took it by force. I mean, we can play this game all day long. The reality is two parties in conflict they have needs and requirements. You want to solve it, they both get what they need. So yeah, June 4, 67 borders. And by the way, with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, it'll have to be more or less the same logic. There, you, you can use creative accounting to make sure that the sum total that the Palestinians get of their remaining 22% of historic Palestine adds up to 100% through swaps of equal size and value, through additional swaps that people need to think through in terms of the, the creativity. Palestinians could get a, a, there could be a Palestinian terminal at Ben Gurion Airport. That would be a, that would be a um, piece of a kind of a swap of real value. So there are all kinds of ways to make the June 467 border work. But yeah, it's going to have to be June 467. Jerusalem, there are three pieces to the Jerusalem problem. There's the old city, one square kilometer. What are you going to do with that? There's the problem of the capital and the neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods adjacent to the Holy Basin and those that were part of the West Bank but have now been incorporated into Israel. And there's the overlapping sacred space issue. All of that is going to have to be worked out so that there is a fix to the sovereignty issue. Palestinians do get a capital in East Jerusalem. And demography probably determines control of neighborhoods and sovereignty. The old city, one square kilometer, you can't divide that up. But it's not beyond the realm of the human imagination if the other issues are coming together to fix that one. And refugees, which on which there has been very little consensus strikes me as also doable, assuming people are prepared to, well, how shall I put this, be reasonable and creative and have the political will, the political will to defend these concessions before their respective constituencies. But all of these things are drawn from this initiative. It's just the initiative is a talking point. It's not a serious blueprint for negotiation. 
And all of these issues are going to have to be fought out and negotiated uh, with the help of a creative, talented, smart, tough, and fair, smart, tough, and fair America. Otherwise, no deal. And we'll be having the same conversation next year. Yes. I, I think you could, but uh, Iraq is going to be a, a. Iraq is the creation of a nation, of a of, uh, of a real nation state with, with sovereignty and control and uh, a social and political contract between. The, I mean, it's very complicated, and it's really going to take. It's a generational proposition. I worry about the use of the word peace when it comes to Arab-Israeli peacemaking because, in my own case, we took it too seriously. We over-sentimentalized it. We thought it was attainable. We didn't understand exactly, even if we thought we knew how difficult it was, we had no idea. And I think it's a very, I mean, I understand why people use it. I really do. And it would be very difficult to take it out of the vocabulary of international politics. Because there are nations who are at peace with one another. I mean, they really are. They have differences, but, you know, and you, you could think back and you could argue, God, given what the French and the Germans or the Germans and the Russians have done to one another over the years, isn't it extraordinary? Millions of French and Germans and Russians that have died, that they've managed to hammer out relationships with one another, that I think you could probably argue were normal, peaceful relations between states. Beyond that, however, I mean, we, we, as I mentioned, the Arabs and Israelis have never had it, they don't have it now, and they're not going to have it. It's peace as the absence of conflict, it's peace as political agreements, <laughs> which are based on mutually acceptable needs and requirements, and it's the beginnings of relationships that transcend politics, that are based on, I don't know, culture, scientific exchanges, mutual respect, admiration, cooperation. I mean, that's a fantasy. But these pieces of paper and remember, we have two of them, Israel, Jordan, Israel, Egypt. As imperfect instruments as they are, they've endured and they've helped reduce conflict, which is frankly a lot. It's real, there's real value there. Yes. The Muslim community where? Well, uh, um, no, I think that, well, there's a certain practicality and pragmatism, I think. There's a certain level of exhaustion, not among Israelis and Palestinians, but clearly uh, among Egyptians, Jordanians, the Lebanese have certainly paid Christians, Muslims, and Druze an enormous price for their physical location. Um, an enormous price. Um, I don't, you know, as much as I believe in public opinion, and it's an arguable proposition, I really believe in leadership. Without leadership, you, I don't think, 
I think the pre-existing prejudices, inertia, and perceptions of Israelis and, and Muslim Arabs, Arab Muslims, if left to their own devices, would lead to future conflict. It is leaders, and all the breakthroughs we've had, Sadat Begin, Arafat Rabin, King Hussein Rabin, have all come as a consequence of individuals who, for any number of reasons, transcended their own communities and led. I think this really is the key. Um, and I worry that we don't have this sort of leadership, which means that local politics, internal politics, and religion in a kind of undirected, um, rampant way may well come to dominate the realities in this particular arena. By themselves, constituencies, look, look on the Israeli-Palestinian side. Palestinians will always be angrier at the Israelis than they, than they ever will be at their own leaders. That prevents any kind of, because I often wondered if George Mitchell were here, he would go on and on about how the Good Friday Agreement, which by the way, has, may well have set into motion the end of the troubles. If you ask, ask him why, this agreement came about, his answer will be, well, there are many reasons, but ordinary Protestants and Catholics got sick and tired of the politicians and the Paris. This doesn't happen with the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Palestinians get angrier at the Israelis than their own leaders. The Israelis continue to trust, because the peace process is so identified with security, <clears throat> the Israelis continue to trust and entrust their government with making these decisions. Can you tell me the last time you saw hundreds of thousands, let's take the Israelis for a minute, of Israelis out into the streets protesting the policies of their government on the Arab-Israeli peace process? It did happen once, and it had an impact, but it had to do with Lebanon an adventure which was ill-advised in 82 and largely unsuccessful. And dissent within the Palestinian community for a host of reasons is simply not possible, not in terms of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians out in the streets protesting Hamas's or the Palestinian Authority's refusal to settle up with the Israelis. I mean, it's mind-boggling even to contemplate it. So, no, if left to their own devices, the Israeli and Palestinian public's initial reaction, and I, I know it sounds cruel and harsh, is probably gonna be to get even. Last question, there is one, yes. Yes to the former, no to the latter. The Israelis have every right to demand as part of their on-the-table negotiations with the Syrians, and this can be easily monitored, that the Syrians stop supplying weapons to Hezbollah. The Israelis cannot demand, well, they can demand, and they will, that the Syrians sever their relationship with the Iranians. They, they won't. This alliance, which is more than 30 years old, and which is based not on ideology. In fact, the reason it survives 
is because Syria and Iran are not ideological competitors. This relationship between an Arab state and a Persian state has endured longer than any of the so-called associations or alliances in the Arab world because it serves the interests of both sides. Syria will not abandon this relationship until it finds suitable alternatives for several things. And while I believe the Israelis can ask legitimately, and let's just talk about us, and America would support that request, if we are demanding that Syria sever its relationship with Iran as part of its treaty with Israel, there'll be no deal. Uh, and let me say something else, which we're going to have to get used to. The get what I call the get out of jail free card for Syrian previous behavior in Lebanon. Syrians and their agents murdered Rafiq Hariri in a calculated uh, and as evil an act as you could find. A very talented man with all of his imperfections. Um, you have an international tribunal in existence which is yet to make a formal and final report on this matter. A way is going to have to be found to deal with that. But keep this in mind. The government of Libya and its agents brought down an American aircraft, Pan Am 103, and killed how many Americans? Almost 300 and they bought their way out of it. So I don't think America is going to stand up for a Lebanese prime minister if it was willing to cut a deal with the Libyans. Now, the two agents, I forget their names now, were tried in a Scottish court in The Hague for since I'm going senile, I cannot remember now what, their, what the ultimate disposition. I mean, I know they were both sentenced convicted and sentenced, but I don't know, I've got to check to see where they are now. So that's the other piece of this. It won't be pretty, but we're going to have to acquiesce in this, I suspect, if the Israelis and Syrians ever reach an agreement. Because one of the reasons that Assad, <coughs> the junior, would want an agreement is to break the international isolation and hotspot he is now in with respect to, uh, to Lebanon. So who are the three Americans before we close? All right, if you don't know the answer to that, I'll, I'll ask you one more question. But this, I'm not going to give you the answer. Who was the only American president to die without being a U.S. citizen? And thank you very much. Thank you.